All right, she's up and running. Very good. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jim Dill. I'm the Senate Chair of the ACF Committee, and I want to welcome everybody here. And uh, we have uh, uh, four items today. Uh, we're starting out with a report back on LD 493, Custom Slaughterhouses. And then we're going to go into LD 1756, uh, work session on uh, conveying some land in Aroostook County, Penobscot County, followed by LD 1828, an act requiring a uh, contract about uh, low cost spaying and neutering. And finally, we'll finish up with LD 1744 about funding for animal welfare. And uh, LD 1921, we actually had our work session on last time right after the uh, hearing. So with that, I will go ahead and start uh, letting folks introduce themselves and I'll start with Representative Paul. Good morning, Good morning. Uh, Representative Randy Hall from uh, Wilton. I represent District 114, six towns in Southern Franklin County. Senator Maxman. Hi, I'm Chloe Maxman. I represent Senate District 13, all of Lincoln County, Washington and Windsor. Representative Landry. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Senator Dill. I'm Scott Landry. I represent the towns of Farmington and New Sharon in Franklin County, District 113. Representative Underwood. Good morning. I'm Joseph Underwood from Presque Isle, District 147 in Presque Isle, Greater Rooster County. Good to see everybody this morning. Thank you. Well, Representative Underwood, we usually ask you how cold it is up there, but it must be balmy up there today, isn't it? It is very balmy. It's up to 39. There we go. Perfect. Uh, House Chair O'Neill. Good morning. Uh, my name is Maggie O'Neill, and I represent House District 15, which is in Saco. Representative Schofield. Good morning, Senator Dill and everyone on the committee. My name's Tom Schofield, and I represent House District 112. I live in the town of Weld, and I represent 17 towns and townships in Franklin and Somerset counties. Thank you. Representative Pluker. Good morning, I'm Bill Pluker. I represent House District 95, which is Warren, Hope, Appleton, and part of Union. And our clerk is Cheryl McGowan, and our analyst is Karen Netto. And as I mentioned, I'm Jim Dill. I represent Senate District Number 5, Northern Penobscot County. And as I mentioned before, in case you're just joining us, we're starting out with a briefing on custom slaughterhouses, followed by LD 1756, 1828, and 1744. That's the order we'll be going in. And those are our three work sessions. So with that, Cheryl, do we know who's given is uh, our, is it Dr. Eberle that's giving a presentation this morning on slaughterhouses or? I do not know, but it's Director Senator McGrady. Dill. Yes. Uh, I see Dr. Eberle and uh, Director yep. McBrady. So we'll let them both in, please. Gotcha. <clears throat> And they're in. All right, I see Dr. Eberle. I don't see Director McBrady yet. There she is. Good morning to you both. Which one is giving the presentation on slaughterhouses? Uh, Director McBrady. Okay, thank you. Director McBrady, good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning, everybody. Representative O'Neill, can you hear me? Good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I will be giving the presentation. Um, and uh, Cheryl, do you have that and will you be controlling it or would you like me to share my screen? Um, you can share your screen or I can do it, whichever. Why don't I try? Um, okay. And uh, we'll go from there. If I need any help, I'll give you a shout. Sure. Can everybody see that now? Yes. Yes, I can. And is it in presentation mode? No. Yes, no? now okay. it is. Okay, terrific. 
Um, so good morning, uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Nancy McBrady. I'm the Director of the Bureau of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Resources. Joining me today is Dr. Jennifer Everly. She is the Director of the Maine Meat and Poultry Inspection Program. Um, she will be quarterbacking me in, in case I, I have uh, anything that I've skipped or if you have technical questions at the end. Um, I know you have a busy schedule today, so I will try and move as rapidly as I can. But we did submit last week uh, a report to the committee. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to look at it, but this presentation tries to give the high uh, view of, of what we've done in the past year since LD 493 was carried over. So as you may remember, LD 493 was uh, brought forward. Uh, it was an act to allow custom slaughterhouses to produce cuts of meat to be sold commercially in the state. That was carried over, but in the interim, the ACF committee requested via a letter to the department that we convene a working group to discuss meat processing bottlenecks and uh, including um, as part of that process, really digging into the urgent need for more meat processing in the state to meet the intense demand uh, for meat processing, uh, the need for more inspectors, additional financial support, and increasing the labor force in this particular industry. So the process that we went through was multifaceted. We convened a listening session with inspected and custom processors uh, last September. We also held a number of consultations with our colleagues at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. We, as a department, um, undertook an infrastructure needs survey that was uh, insightful as we continued our work. We conducted outreach to the Department of Labor, the Department of Corrections, and the Maine Community College System. Uh, Dr. Eberly and her colleagues at uh, Cooperative Extension submitted a grant to the USDA for a meat processing, processing feasibility study, which unfortunately was not funded, but we would like to see done on our own. So I'll talk to about that in a little bit. Um, the meat and poultry inspection program made direct outreach to processors uh, within uh, the state of Maine about a USDA grant program called the Meat and Poultry Readiness Inspection Program. And uh, we're delighted that seven of the applicants from Maine were funded. Uh, I'll go into that a little bit further too. We are requesting additional support for MMPI uh, staffing in the supplemental budget. We conducted outreach to other states about what they are doing around skills training for meat processing. We looked at the USDA funding programs that are becoming stood up uh, as part of the American uh, Recovery Plan. There's a lot of moving parts there, so we're watching that closely because there's a lot of money potentially that could come to uh, applicants here in the state of Maine. We are we have launched as a department agricultural infrastructure investment program, which I think you are all are familiar with, um, and meat processing uh, applications um, will certainly be, be uh, part of that mix. And we also created a new variance committee within the department that will allow for retail operations to expand into smoked and cured meat uh, production. Um, and we can talk later about the benefits of that. So in, in all, LD 493 request really helped crystallize a lot of our work that had been ongoing as well as got us to do and look into other areas um, all surrounding meat processing and poultry processing in the state. So it was really a, a relevant and useful exercise. The themes and issues that really uh, came through loud and clear are presented on this slide. The lack of labor is the most pressing issue facing these processors, and there needs to be more skilled labor in order to have a sustainable labor force. Infrastructure investments are definitely needed, not only to enhance existing plants, but also new plants, and in locations that are currently lacking such resources. Business planning and training is needed to help plants navigate their slower periods of business, that's something we can talk about in a little bit, but it is seasonal. And so in the downtimes, there needs to be careful planning and adjustments as to fill those gaps 
for these businesses. Education likewise is needed for those who are producing livestock for processing, especially those who are new to livestock and may need additional help in understanding when animals are ready uh, for processing and what condition they should be in. And lastly, uh, more inspectors are needed uh, within the MMPI program. Let me briefly touch on our current meat and poultry processing landscape. Under our state program, the MMPI, we have eight state inspected facilities. There are also 44 custom slaughterhouses and processors and 60 poultry operators. Of the eight state inspected facilities, these folks are responsible for uh, the production of half of the state's total inspected meat slaughter capacity and half of the inspected poultry processing capacity in the state. So this is very significant. What they do and what they produce um, really uh, fuels um, the, the capacity and the product availability in the state. In, um, here's some statistics on the right-hand side of the slide. In uh, fiscal year 2020, um, 1.5 million pounds of red meat were processed and 33,000 uh, poultry birds were processed. And that was a significant increase over fiscal year 19. In fiscal year 21, we also had robust uh, meat processing, uh, 1.4 million and an increase in 46,000, uh, an increase up to 46,000 processed poultry birds as well. So um, this has been a, a sustained uh, level of production and demand upon these uh, producers here in the state. A little bit more about the landscape, I'm stating the obvious, but there are not enough inspected slaughterhouses in the state to slaughter and process the number of animals that producers wish to raise and have handled here in the state. And on the right is a hopefully interpretable uh, map of where these processing sites are in the state. And you can see there's a, a lot of empty space um, among these eight. USDA and state facilities were over capacity pre-pandemic, but of course this was made worse by COVID-19 supply chain disruptions. And producers, as you know, are making appointments for processing at the very least, many, many months in advance or even years in advance in order to get uh, their foot in the door. So before we go into what the listening sessions uh, delved into, I just wanted to, again, circle back on what we have been doing prior to LD-493 and then what really got accelerated as a result of that. And also what's been happening on, on the federal level because it all comes together to demonstrate that there is momentum and there's, there's currently a lot of funding, fortunately, that is heading into this, uh, into this industry. Um, we did do a lot of outreach to existing processors uh, during the pandemic to understand their resource constraints um, in light of the explosion of local demand and really heard from them what they would need um, in terms of investment opportunities. That um, was, was uh, made very clear when um, at the end of 2020, there was the CARES Act Agricultural and Food Infrastructure Reimbursement Program, which you may recall, we were able to um, disperse about $17 million to uh, agricultural producers in the state from that um, amount of federal funding. And in particular, um, $904,000 went directly to meat processors. Uh, we then thereafter undertook a heritage industry survey that went out to agricultural producers in Maine. And that confirmed their interest in expanding uh, uh, investments in a number of places such as on-site on storage, processing capacity and packaging capacity. We also partnered with the University of Maine School of Economics to have them undertake um, an economic uh, uh, investment assessment uh, in processing, including meat processing. And uh, their takeaway was that just a 50% increase in meat processing um, infrastructure businesses in the state of Maine would result in a, a very measurable uh, increase um, or robust amount of sales, jobs, and uh, labor income. So we know that there is potential uh, within meat processing in the state of Maine. 
And uh, as I mentioned at the top of my intro, the USDA meat and poultry inspection readiness grants in 2021 um, were uh, successful here in the state with seven producers applying and a little over a million dollars is going to these applicants, which is super exciting. And the report uh, identifies who those folks are and what they'll be using the money for. We also have our Ag Infrastructure Investment Program currently open. Applications end at the end of this month. Um, meat and poultry processing improvements and infrastructure investments will definitely be eligible for review. As I mentioned, we have a variance committee now, and they will be reviewing variances requested under the food code, which does allow variances that uh, would be applicable to retail operations to expand into smoked and cured meat production. Um, right now, it's, it's not necessarily a, an easy thing to obtain. And so we were just thinking that by having this variance committee stood up, we would be able to facilitate the expansion of, of interested retailers uh, cap capability to produce smoke, uh, smoked and cured meats um, and, and ease some bottlenecks around that. Um, there's also on the horizon $1 billion in American Rescue Plan funds within USDA that is looking specifically at the expansion of independent processing capacity for meat and poultry. And there's a host of programs that are gonna bubble out of that, including low interest loans, just a lot of capital running into this industry. And um, we're committed as a department and as, a, as the MMPI program to uh, keeping our processors aware of these um, opportunities and letting them know how to avail themselves of that. So really just trying to be um, cheerleaders and encouragers for them to pursue these opportunities if it makes sense for their businesses. And I also wanted to mention that in 2021, a new permanent uh, inspector position was funded um, and a new permanent inspection pro process analyst position was authorized by the legislature that really brought some much needed stability uh, to the MMPI, which was fantastic. So thank you for your support for that. Moving into the listening session, we held two of them in September. Um, one was for the state inspected processors and one was for custom processors. Uh, the feedback from these sessions really was quite uniform um, and really bubbling to the top is uh, the, the lack of an available labor force. That is not surprising given our um, labor situation across the United States and in Maine but um, it's being felt uh, very acutely within meat and poultry processing. And while there is not much of a barrier for entry into uh, meat processing, what is important to note is that skills training is needed because um, of the, the processing process, um, the more training that uh, is available, um, the more productive and, and skilled these uh, workers are, higher wages, uh, et cetera. So there really is a need for training, which these processes are so busy, uh, it's, it's hard to keep up with and doing for their, uh, for their own employees. Um, the cost of doing business is rising, not surprising as well, but we heard about you know, insurance, healthcare, packaging costs, ingredients, um, you name it, it runs the gamut um, for these small businesses. So not surprisingly, significant infrastructure investments are needed. Um, and this goes at the, the existing uh, processors um, just to keep up with the demand that they have. And that in order to get it on par and hopefully in advance of the demand, um, larger and newer facilities would be needed. And as a result, more inspectors from the state too. As I mentioned earlier, the seasonality of the business can be really challenging. Obviously livestock are going to be um, ready for processing at various times of the year, and then there will be slow times. So we did hear from some processors who are thinking creatively about how to adjust by uh, accepting you know, additional types of animals for processing, but really highlighting that business consultation and assistance is needed. Um, and to further that point, scheduling is a real problem too. We heard from a number of processors that because of the demand for processing, they are you know, taking an inordinate amount of time just responding to requests and scheduling people 
Some people schedule it more than one processor to hedge their bets, and then they fail to call and cancel at that other processor, which leaves a hole in their schedule for that day. And then there are some people who also just skip the appointment altogether. So there was conversations around the need for business tools, technology tools that would allow some of these processors to have automatic reminders to um, livestock producers, you know, just to manage these appointments more easily and to uh, allow for more um, uh, uh, or to eliminate the, the no show problem that they were describing. And as I mentioned as well, uh, there's a real need to ensure that the livestock, when they do arrive, when these uh, animals do arrive, that they're in the right shape uh, and in the right conditions um, for processing. Not only will that be a better quality product at the end, but um, it just is, is useful information for these producers to understand um, you know, management and, and scheduling and uh, other types of handling needs. So we then pivoted from those uh, discussions with the processors themselves to a couple of uh, partners within the state. The main department of labor um, under the main jobs and recovery program being funded by uh, the um, American recovery program funds is setting up a new grant program that is open now for employers to apply for funding to create apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeship programs for their businesses. And I do want to mention that in our report, we talk about a lot of these training ideas in more detail, including apprenticeships. So that's why this was of relevance to us, because perhaps there is room for exploration <clears throat> of this new grant program um, for some of these producers to apply um, and see if a, an apprenticeship program could be built out of that. Um, there's also an initiative uh, similarly funded to identify uh, workforce development needs and assistance around recruitment, training, and education. There is a longstanding main apprenticeship program at the Department of Labor that uh, may be worth exploring by some of these processors. And so um, we will be connecting folks to the Department of Labor on all of these points to see if any of this um, makes sense for these small businesses and their unique needs. The Department of Labor also mentioned that pre-pandemic, um, there were oftentimes job fairs at correctional facilities uh, that proved to be very beneficial in particular for the construction industry. And the thinking was that when it is safe, um, uh, this might be something worth exploring um, for some uh, uh, business owners as well when it comes to meat handling and, and skills training uh, to have those conversations. Um, importantly, uh, we want folks to also be aware that as employers, there is a tax credit program in existence that allows employers to receive tax, cred tax credits if they uh, employ previously incarcerated uh, folks within one year of release. Um, and as I mentioned, we just really are gonna be aiming to allow for connectivity between the processor uh, community and the Department of Labor to see whether uh, any of this might be a good fit. Um, the labor discussions with the main Department of Corrections and the main community college was, was really fun. Uh, we had a lot of great uh, discussions, brainstorming around this, and I'm really hopeful that there, there can be um, opportunities that come out of this. Um, you may know that the Department of Corrections has work release programs at a number of its facilities around the state um, that could be explored for meat processing as well. Um, and the Boldick, Charleston, and Southern Maine Women's Reentry facilities were highlighted as possible locations for, for further exploration around this. Contingent upon work release programs, however, is transportation, which would need to be provided by an outside party. And most occasions, it's the processor or the, I'm sorry, the, the employer that is uh, partaking in the program itself. So notably, that is something that would need to be addressed. Um, the Department of Corrections also have existing facilities, uh, you know, commercial kitchens in, in essence, uh, to provide um, meals for their um, inmates and, and others. And so really the thinking was, could these be outfitted in some way to meet the standards necessary um, for skills training and processing to occur 
there. And so we committed to having some of our inspectors and, and Dr. Everly visit, engage what it might take to convert um, these kitchens um, and their cold storage uh, to, to meet the needs of, of appropriate uh, meat uh, processing. So while there might be the nuts and bolts for this type of activity to happen, what's also necessary and would go hand in hand is developing appropriate curriculum so that um, these, these individuals at the corrections facilities could learn and hopefully uh, be awarded um, upon completion some certification that they could then take with them uh, upon release and enter the workforce with a, a valuable um, uh, you know, element on their resume, so to speak. So um, the main community college folks were very open to reviewing the potential to develop curriculum, not only for uh, the Department of Corrections, but also within the main community college itself because they have culinary training within I believe five of their campuses. So um, curriculum is a very important uh, thing to be considering and we need to dig into. Fortunately, there are some states that are doing uh, meat cutting training, um, Oklahoma and Minnesota, for instance. And we included some information about that in our appendix to our report. And then beyond the curriculum, as I mentioned, how about certification? So would there be some sort of certification that could come out of this process for um, incarcerated individuals as well as within the MCC community? So there's so much more to unpack here and to dive into that we have agreed to form an exploratory committee, committee this year to really um, frame this out and see what are the, the easy uh, low hanging fruit versus the, those that will need um, more infrastructure and perhaps legislative funding and support. Um, and then it's just also very, very important for you all to realize that University of Maine Cooperative Extension is likewise very plugged in to meat and poultry uh, training and skills uh, assistance. Um, they do have courses that are mentioned in the first bullet. And the meat and poultry course is quite robust. It's 16 hours of instruction um, and development of a HACCP plan um, for $275. And that includes the sanitation training. Um, the meat cutting school is 35 hours of uh, on hand, hands on training and it costs more, um, but they are in process of moving that into an online training as well, given, or maybe they already have, I'm, I'm forgetting that important detail. Um, so as to make that more applicable given uh, the COVID realities we're living in right now. The Dr. Matthew Highlands pilot plant is a registered custom meat processing facility. So this is where all the action happens when it comes to the meat cutting school. Um, and then the, it's important that folks who, who uh, partake in these training exercises, it's important for you to know that there's micro credentialing as UMC is calling it. Um, that they essentially are going to be receiving level one, two, or three safety badges signifying competencies in these skills. So that is something that people can take with them as they uh, hopefully enter that area um, for, for jobs, seeking jobs. So our recommendations are the following. Um, the exploratory committee uh, will be of uh, the various departments and agencies that I mentioned, uh, as well as the Maine Community College System, University of Maine Cooperative Extension, and processors who would like to join us. Um, the architecture of this has not been fully uh, you know, uh, outfitted just yet, and this is not an exhaustive list, but really leaning into the idea of these apprenticeships as well as the uh, skills training um, within corrections and the main community college system. Um, these are some of the strategies that we're thinking about uh, in that second bullet. And um, it's important to note, we, we were taking attention, we were, we were attentive to Oklahoma or Minnesota, one of the two states that um, has mobile training and processing units. And is that something worth considering as well? We would like to be able to report back to you at the next legislative session as to our accomplishments in this realm and hope that we might be able to provide you um, with some really unique opportunities for further pursuit. We are also recommending that a new position be created at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension for HACCP work. Um, 
it's a little intricate in that we suggest that the funding come to the department so that we then create through an MOU or a contract uh, a means of underwriting this uh, position. It's my understanding that uh, the legislature can't necessarily allocate specifically to the University of Maine system. Um, and so this would be a way to, to allow for this uh, new position to be stood up. Um, why is this an important position to have? Well, they would be assisting in the development and writing of HACCP safety plans for meat and poultry processors, as well as seafood processors, um, who are an important part of this landscape too. And um, this would just be a really welcome uh, resource in what is a very detailed and time-consuming process. And um, they'd be able to help in the drafting of the plans um, and, and alleviate hurdles that right now are holding some of these folks back. Um, the position would cost around $105,000 all encompassing on an annual basis. That does not include, however, um, you know, cost of uh, annual adjustments, cost of living adjustments and um, inflation. But that is our best bet as of 2022 of what it would cost uh, for this position. Recommendation three is uh, for you all to please support our request in the supplemental budget for additional um, MMPI staffing. Um, we have one current position that is a limited term inspector position, which is a precarious position to be in, and we would like to make that permanent. And we have also asked for one new permanent MMPI position to the program. Um, why is this important? Well, of the seven recipients um, of that USDA grant, three would be new, uh, newly inspected slaughter and processing facilities. So they would be requiring our daily um, inspection on site, uh, whereas they don't need that right now. And we just need to be available uh, to keep up with the, with the increasing demand for inspection services. And last, um, oh no, this isn't last, sorry. Uh, support funding for a main specific feasibility study. I mentioned at the top that we had applied to USDA for um, a feasibility study that unfortunately was not successful, but we believe very strongly in um, that application and that concept. It was attached as an attachment to our report. And it's because um, the work would really be doing more than we were able to do um, in, this, in this last six or so months by digging into the financial, physical, re regulatory, and cultural barriers um, uh, for increased meat and poultry slaughter and processing in the state. And very importantly, they would use that data to then model three different theoretical slaughter and processing operations in the state of Maine um, and really look at what that takes financially um, and, and beyond in order to stand those up. And I think that would be very useful for people who are contemplating entering this space uh, or, or trying to seek investment um, for their plans to do that because it would be a very uh, uh, technical report um, providing a lot of useful information. And we know of other states that have done that and it has been very helpful. Um, and last, I believe, this is my final slide. Um, we would like to assist University of Maine Cooperative Extension in building out its animal finishing standards training. Um, so that livestock producers are, are coming um, to the processors ready to go with animals that are in the correct uh, shape and form for that. Um, we are looking within our own coffers to see if we might be able to uh, enter into a, an MOU to provide some supports financially to UMC to do that. So that's not a recommendation for you folks um, to, to take action on, but just to let you know that this is something that we want to see happen and we'll be uh, trying to find a way to support that on our own. So that is it. I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, I'm sorry it took so long. And if you have any questions, uh, Dr. Everly and I are happy to answer them. Are there any questions concerning the slaughterhouse? Yes, uh, Representative Kluker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director McBrady, for being here. I had a few, but I'm going to also try to shrink them down. For the animal fishing, finishing, are we looking at grass, not just uh, grain finishing? Absolutely. Yeah. No, no differentiation. Is, is, will there be, like looking at both the cooperative extension position, the additional staffing to MPI, as well as the feasibility study, 
do you have any way, have you made a request to the governor to, to increase put any of that into the supplemental budget? Do we, or do we need to take some legislative action to make sure that happens? So the supplemental budget does, uh, we, we requested the MMPI positions. Um, because of the, the, the robust request that the department put in um, generally for the supplemental, what did not, uh, what was not included was the uh, HACCP plan position at the University of Maine or the feasibility study. The HACCP, was that the cooperative extension position? Yes. Yes. Okay. HACCP was not included. And which other one was not included? The feasibility study, which uh, we reckon will be about a hundred and hundred thousand dollars or so. And so, if if we were to put that into our our report back from the committee, you would be able to you have the wherewithal to contract for that if you had the funding. If we had the funding, yes, I believe that we would. All right, just so the committee all knows, I would love to do that work to help fund those things. Uh, and then the other part was I, I somehow I read the report, but I must have been skimming and I missed so much of the collaboration with DOC. That's really exciting and great. I, um, you know, my I live in a town with two of the four state prisons in the state of Maine and as well as one of our USDA slaughtering facilities. So please, um, please work with anything I can do to support that effort and help it move it along, you know, including participating in the exploratory committee. I don't know if you want legislative participation there or not, but Happy, Happy to work to with you and yeah. support that in any way I can. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's right up my alley. And then um, when it comes to the production of smoked and cured meats, is that currently, so you're doing that, you're going to allow that in some ways in the retail facilities. Is that currently allowed in restaurants? I don't know the answer to that. Dr. Eberly? Um, the rest, if, if the restaurant is doing it and they're not, then they're serving the product, they're not selling it on the side. Um, that falls under DHHS. Um, so I can't really answer to what they're allowing there. Um, but if there's a retailer that wishes to make a smoked product that they're smoking for preservation, right, it's like a salami, right? Um, they, if they apply for a variance from the food code, they can sell that product to the end consumer. They still can't wholesale, it's not inspected. It's still an exempt product, but if they can produce it themselves under the exemption with the variance, then you know Smith Smokehouse doesn't have to do it for them. So it's a way to kind of ease a little bit of the bottleneck on those products. Representative Pluker, I'm gonna come back to you. You got other people yes, with hands you. up, so I'll come back to you. Representative Landry. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Senator Dill. Uh, Director McBrady, nice presentation. It's sorely needed. Representative Fluker hit on a lot of my points. The question about the supplemental budget, whether the funding was included was key. And uh, going to have your hands full, and I fully support whatever you can do. Thank you. Representative McRae. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess under the category of trying to learn something every day, uh, uh, Mr. Brady, could you explain, you mentioned several times or it was mentioned, the condition and shape of the animals as they are presented to a slaughterhouse. Are those just the very obvious things or is there something that I would be interested in? Or um, we would be interested in? Sure. So we were hearing directly from processors who were finding that some livestock producers, not, not all of course, but some, and some who have entered into um, raising their own animals relatively recently, um, uh, have you know made appointments for slaughter when the animals may have been underweight or just were not in the right position for that to be really the appropriate thing to do at that time. You know, animals, they, so, so yes, it's, it's almost a little bit of just basic um, education uh, for the ideally the University of Maine Cooperative Extension livestock specialists to, to lean into and, and to help provide that guidance so that folks really can bring animals at the right time um, and place, so. Okay, thank you very much. And if Dr. Everly, am I missing anything there or did I cover that? No, I think too fat animals is actually a worse problem for some of them. <laughs> they keep them too long, they spend too much money and then they're too fat and then they don't get back what they think they should get because 
the animal is just too fat. <laughs> so that's what I learned. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Underwood. Yes, I, I agree. That was an excellent presentation. Walking, walking that, walking it, working our audience from point A to point B, right through to the finish. Uh, what does MMPI stand for? That is our main meat and poultry inspection program. Thank you. The other, the other question I had was under uh, you were listing. I think believe it was barriers. And one of them was listed as cultural barriers. Could we strike that from, from your slides or presentation, or even if, to keep it out of the law? Is that possible, please, for that requirement? Well, I think one of the things that I'd just like to mention, Representative Underwood, is that um, there's a, a broad spectrum of, of types of foods um, that are eaten um, uh, across the board by Mainers of all types. And uh, one type is halal meat which um, is slaughtered in a way that is specialized. And that's what we were referencing, for instance, that in order to provide food, uh, finished meat products that meet those standards, um, it's just, there's demand for that. I think uh, processors and producers would love to be able to service that community. Um, and therefore we would just want to make sure that that's considered in a feasibility analysis. That's the only thing that we were referencing by that, sir. Thank you. Very good. Representative Pluker. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, going back to the cured meats, uh, is that something that farmers can get an exemption to? Or are, are, is there, are there any cured feeds, meats being produced on farms? Um, if they, I, I'm sorry, I can, I can take this one. Um, if they have a, if the farmer has a commercial processing license, right, with the department, they then fall under the main food code. Um, as long as that farmer is selling that product retail, uh, that would be fine. So if they want to go to farmer's markets all summer and sell salami, that, that, that doesn't have to be a bricks and mortar retail operation. It just can't be wholesaled. They can't sell it to other stores, but, but they could sell it at farmer's markets. They could sell it from their farm stand, um, et cetera. So. Great, thank you. And I think my final question was, do we have any sense of like the percentage of animals that are being processed in our facilities in the state of Maine that are coming from out of the state? So when we're looking at pressure on our processing facilities, how much of that is due to due, due to animals being brought in? I, I can't speak to USDA facilities. Um, there are almost no animals brought, being brought in from out of state at state facilities that I'm aware of. Aside from the occasional, you know, my brother in New Hampshire gave me this cow kind of thing. Uh, there's, there's nothing being trucked in to state inspected facilities. Could you just remind me of how many state facilities are versus USDA facilities? Uh, there's eight state inspected facilities. Uh, USDA has, um, I believe, six slaughter facilities. And I'd have to look it up. Something like 10, 11 processing facilities. Okay, thank you very much. Representative Hall. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Senator Dill. And uh, thank you, uh, Director McBrady. That was an excellent presentation. The question I had is, you mentioned there was three facilities that were coming on um, that were gonna require inspectors. How many inspectors do you have and how many more inspectors do you anticipate that it will take to uh, cover these new facilities when they do get online? I'll direct that question to uh, Dr. Everly. Okay, so um, we currently have six inspectors. I just got a new one, so I'm just, I'm counting in my head quickly. Uh, we have six inspectors. Um, of those three new facilities, uh, under the terms of the grant, they have something like three years to go into inspection. So I don't expect any of them, there's one who might come under this year, but I don't think the other one will. Of those three, one of them is actually going to go USDA inspection. So we will not have to staff that one. Um, the other two, we, would, we will have to staff. Uh, one of them is down in Kennebunk. Um, we do have an inspector in the Portland area, but we will need another inspector in that area. And then, um, long term, and then the other one is up in Albion. So ultimately, we probably need two more inspectors, but in the short term, one more inspector should be adequate. 
Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions for Director McBrady or Dr. Eberle? All right, seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation. And I believe we've got a public hearing on this next week on LD 493. And with that, uh, we'll move on from our presentation onto our work sessions. And I'll open the work session on LD 1756, resolve authorizing the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry to convey certain land in Arista County and Penobscot County. So with that, I'll turn to Karen. Um, and on 493, it's a work session on work Tuesday, session. not a public right. hearing. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, so 1756 was tabled at the last work session. So it needs to be taken off the table. Yep. Can I have a motion to take it off the table, please? Representative O'Neill, move, fall and seconded by Representative Landry. All in favor, turn your screens on so I can see, please. Representative McRae, Representative Schofield. Yes, yes, yes. I don't know where Representative McRae is, but everybody has said yes, uh, that we can see. We are having a little technical difficulties. Is that correct, Cheryl, letting some people in for this bill? Yes, I finally was able to get Representative Martin in but I'm, now I'm still having problems getting in Bill Patterson. I'm trying to promote him now. And Eben, whatever the last name is. Bukowski. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, he's moving around on me. All right, so at least Karen, would you start with uh, bringing us up to speed? Sure, so at the last work session, there are two sections um, to this resolve that would uh, propose to convey uh, state land um, to another entity. And uh, section one was in uh, re relating to a parcel in Aroostook County um, and it's uh, to, to convey to a willing buyer uh, a parcel of land um, totaling approximately 5,000 acres. And this is the section that seemed to generate the, the most conversation and some opposition. Um, and then in section two, um, which is a parcel in Penobscot County, it um, would authorize the state to convey property to Baxter State Park. And there seemed to be no opposition to this section of the bill. Um, so one thing that I will say, we did, I think, while the work session was going on, but um, just to point your attention to a letter that we received the same day as the work session from the Allagash Wilderness Waterway Foundation, um, the president of the foundation, Bob McIntosh, did say, you know, essentially that, you know, they didn't, um, they, um, did not become aware of the bill until you know the, the evening before uh, the work session and they haven't had time to review the whole uh, property in question. So they did ask um, the committee's consideration of maybe uh, deferring that part of the bill to the next session. But I know Representative Martin um, might have been done something between the last work session and, and today. So. Um, and he is here to, to speak to that. Okay. Anything else, Karen, before we turn to Representative Martin? No. Any questions for Karen? All right, Representative Martin, I know we had, uh, I think there was a discussion around the possibility of you putting in another bill to separate these two out. Is You're, you're muted, Representative Martin. I think I'm fine now. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Uh, after uh, the week after, I, 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 we, I said the department, uh, at least Bob uh, was there, 
uh, I'm sorry, Bill uh, Patterson and I and other members of the department as well talked about the process and basically came to a conclusion that based in, in part on uh, the letter that you have in front of you from Bob McIntosh of the Allagash Wilderness Waterway Foundation, uh, they have hired uh, a person last year, an ecologist, which is basically to manage the project and oversee uh, along the waterway. And that work is ongoing and will continue through this year. So basically they, they feel that they would like to wait uh, until that is done before anything is done uh, on, on the Rustic part. I, I, I think I'm not, I'm not speaking out of turn. I think the department has come to that conclusion as well, uh, but I'll let them. Okay, I'll ask Mr. Patterson. So is that uh, the conclusion that the department's had also? Uh, yes, that's correct. Thank you, uh, Representative Martin. Um, we would also recommend that the bills be split and um, that we postpone movement on the Allagash, um, the 12-13 parcel until the next session. Okay, so when we amend this uh, bill today during this work session, we will certainly most likely cleave that off and, and then we'll just now continue with that discussion around um, the Baxter piece in uh, Penobscot County. Um, Karen, is there anything else you wanna say about that out of it? Um, I mean, there's nothing really new to say from the last work session. Um, I think this uh, conveyance is for a very different reason than um, section one of the bill is in that it's just geographically wedged between um, the National Monument and um, Baxter State Park. So it's more for um, logistical access issues um, that it would make sense from the Bureau's perspective to convey this uh, piece of property. And there, and there's, I didn't hear any opposition at the public hearing um, to that point. Okay. Uh, Representative Schofield. Senator Dill, I would make a motion that we, we uh, proceed with the uh, back extra part portion as described in the bill. Okay, and before and, I ask for, and, yep, go ahead. And to, uh, for this time and at this time to eliminate the uh, the Allagash portion. Okay. If that's the word. Thank you. Yeah, before I second that, I do want to turn to Evan and ask him if there's any concerns that they see about the uh, Baxter pot. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Senator Dill. No, I, I don't think we've we've identified any concerns with the bill as presented initially, our okay. portion of it. All right, thank you. Can I have a second to Representative Schofield? Representative seconded. Underwood? Seconded. Yep, seconded by Representative Underwood. Further discussion? Representative Hall. No, I was just going to second the motion. I'm all set. Okay. Um, with that, seeing no further discussion, then I would ask that uh, you call the roll, please, Cheryl. Yes, uh, LD 1756 ought to pass as amended. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Absent. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield, yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher, yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood, yes. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford. Absent. Representative David McRae. Yes. Representative David McRae. Yes. Representative Susan Bernard. Absent. 10 yes, three absent. 
Okay, on LD seventeen fifty six, resolve. I mean, excuse me. Yes, resolve authorizing the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry to convey certain land in Aristic County and Penobscot County. Um, it passes ten zero three as amended. I will close the work session on LD seventeen fifty six, and we will open up the work session on LD eighteen twenty eight an act requiring a contract for the administration of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry, low cost spaying and neutering program. Would you please let in Liam Hughes and Senator Breen, please, Cheryl. Okay, Senator Breen is in, and I'm gonna try to let in, well, maybe I'm not, I can't, I can't move my, there it is, okay. Senator Dill, this was tabled, so uh, it needs to come off the table before oh. discussion. Yep. Can I have a motion to remove this from the table? Removed by Representative Hall, seconded by Representative Kluger. All in favor, just raise your hands, please. And uh, everyone that I can see has their hand raised. Thank you. It is off the table and onto the floor now, Karen. Yes, and uh, speaking of which, uh, just to remind everyone, there was a motion made. Um, so there is a pending motion on the floor of ought to pass as amended. So I, uh, Representative O'Neill made the motion, Representative Hall, I believe seconded it. So I have been working uh, with Representative Representative O'Neill and the sponsor of the bill, Senator Breen on um, language uh, that would uh, basically uh, relay uh, what the, the motion was. So I, I can either go through that now or if you want Senator Green um, to go through it um, either way. You have it in a form that you can share with us? Sure, yeah, it might take me a second to- Yeah, it's to just easier it if, if we see it as we're asking questions and whoever's gonna go through it. Yep, absolutely. Senator Dill, was it just the two persons that you wanted in? Um, I think so at the moment. Okay. Very good, thank you. Just want to make sure I got it there. Yeah. I'm just assuming we have the right Liam Hughes since there's another one uh, in the waiting room, but. Uh, um, All right, so do you see the amendment? Yes. Okay. Um, so the first part of the amendment uh, amends. So let's go back <laughs> to the original proposal. So under current law, the commissioner of ACF may contract the administration of the Companion Animal Sterilization Fund, also known as the Help Fix Me program. So what this bill proposed to do is require that the commissioner contract for the administration of this uh, fund and program. So um, in section one, um, it, it keeps that requirement that uh, the shell contract administration of the fund. Um, it uh, clarifies that the, the organization that should be contracted with is an animal welfare organization. And then um, it also removes the word individual. Um, Senator Green um, had mentioned that in her conversations with advocates, they raised concerns that having one individual managing the program may be problematic. I think this was the case in the state of Vermont. So um, their preference would be to stay with uh, an organization. And then um, the amendment just you know, gives uh, the commissioner authority to adopt rules governing the contract to explicitly state that in that section of law and the rules are routine technical. And then at the bottom of that uh, first paragraph 1A, it says that the administration of the fund must revert to the department if a third party administrator cannot be found. Um, at, at the last work session, uh, Senator Breen did provide a memo of sort of uh, suggestions on how to amend the bill. And um, she heard, you know, the department's concerns raised about, well, what if we can't find a suitable third party administrator? Um, then we're kind of um, 
in a bad situation. So this is sort of a, uh, a safeguard to address that concern if a, a third party administrator cannot be found. And then um, you go, there's two section twos here, but the next one, um, section two that you would insert right after the original section one. This is uh, another major piece of the motion that Representative O'Neill made at the work session. This is um, providing uh, vouchers to cover 100% of the cost for uh, the spaying and neutering of feral cats. So the language reads that the commissioner shall issue vouchers uh, without a requirement for a co-payment to a person regardless of that person's income to cover 100% of the cost uh, for spaying and neutering of feral cats. Um, and then you could probably just strike that last sentence. Um, I did find the, I did find a definition of feral cat in the department rules, but somehow I missed that there was already a definition um, for uh, this section of law. Um, I forget what the chapter number is, uh, chapter 717, part nine, animal welfare. There's already a statutory uh, definition for feral cats. So it'd be my suggestion to just strike that definition completely since one already exists and it, this may cause more confusion. It's so is my mistake. Um, and then uh, the second sub section two at the bottom of page one of three, um, this is a little bit um, new from the motion that was made. It's just kind of further clarification. And I think Representative O'Neill would consider it as a friendly amendment. Um, right now in law, the Animal Welfare Advisory Council does have oversight. Karen, excuse me, can you scroll down the way you're talking about? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so this shaded area, and I, I do that just to show how it's different from the original bill. So um, at the bottom of page one, it um, strikes um, the council's oversight of the fund. Um, so right now the council shall review the objectives of the fund and make recommendations. Um, so this uh, amendment proposes to, to strike that completely. Um, and then going on to sections three and four, which are unallocated sections of the amendment. Section three speaks to um, the specifics on the, the contract itself. Uh, the and again, I, I didn't consult with the department on the dates here. So the committee may want to ask them if those dates work, but um, it requires the commissioner to promulgate rules no later than July 1st of this year to contract the administration of the fund. And then it specifies that the initial contract uh, with a third party administrator must be for 36 months. And then, um, there are requirements of the third party administrator. And again, this is largely from the memo that Senator Green had provided to the committee uh, at the last work session. So there are five points. Um, the first is demonst demonstrate a dedication to spay and neuter companion animals and feral cats and target low income communities and populations to the extent possible. Number two is have the technical expertise to operate the program. Uh, number three is maintain the staff necessary to field phone calls in a timely manner and to provide vouchers to program applicants within seven bus business days of receipt of co-payment and satisfactory proof of eligibility. And that it does say, you know, say except that co-payment is not required for the spaying and, and neutering of feral cats. And then number four is uh, ensure privacy of the information of applicants. And then number five is commit to a strong customer service. Um, and then finally, uh, sec section four of the amendment, um, there is a requirement that the department or commissioner of ACF conduct an evaluation of this initial uh, three-year contract. And then it spells out the criteria for the evaluation. And again, um, upon completion of the evaluation, again, this date is sort of tied to 
the date by which they're uh, supposed to adopt rules. So again, um, I would say you may want to check with the department if that time frame works. But um, upon completion of the evaluation, no later than January 1st, 2026, um, keeping in mind that you need to give them uh, time for the contract to uh, be entered into and, and, and to happen the three year period. Uh, the department submits a report to this committee and then you have authority to submit to the, to the first regular of the 132nd legislature. Thank you. Are there questions for Karen? Representative O'Neill, anything you'd like to add to what's been said, uh, what Karen just went through? Um, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think if anyone, I'd like to hear from um, the sponsor to see if yep. this reflects um, all of her intents and the intents of the stakeholders. Yeah, that's where I was going next. Senator Breen. Good morning, um, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill. Uh, thank you for having me back. Um, uh, I did some work on the initial, um, uh, on the initial, um, amendment that Representative O'Neill had drafted, um, and, um, Karen was also, your analyst was also very helpful. Um, I also, um, watched the, uh, first meeting, the, the meeting of the Animal Welfare Advisory um, council that took place um, the night, the evening before the um, public or the work session, our last work session. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and then, so all of that put together all those um, and decided that this was probably the best, um, the best way to go. I think that the department has uh, legitimate concerns about whether $60,000 for the contract annually is gonna be sufficient, you know, cause right now it's the statute caps, the administrative costs at 15%. And if it's $400,000 a year, roughly, um, that's only about 60,000 to uh, administer it. So I, I'd, I, my answer to that was like, let's see, you know, put out the RFP and see if there's an organization who is willing and able to take it on. Um, and then of course we have the safeguard um, that if nobody else, if nobody does that, then um, it, it reverts back to the department. So um, I think for now, I'm happy with where things are and um, would ha be happy to take any questions. Or are there any questions for Senator Breen? Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Breen, for all your work on, um, on these amendments. My um, question is about the 60,000 that you flagged. Do you have um, any proposed changes to, to you know, make it a better structure? Uh, I don't at this time. No, I mean, I, I would hate to, I mean, I think 15% is probably a reasonable um, oversight, you know, administrative um, cost. I would, I would hate to see any more going to, to overhead um, because I think it's really important that the, the money get out to the community and for the purposes that it's there for. Um, so I think I would, I mean, my suggestion would be that if, if nobody um, comes forward with the, um, to answer, you know, to bid on the RFP that um, we could revisit this and, you know, potentially um, change that number if that should happen. But I, I wouldn't want to do that right away. Great. Thank you. And one more follow-up question, Mr. Chair. Sure. Um, I just had a follow-up question about um, rulemaking and, and whether stakeholders feel okay with that timeline and whether um, the turnaround will be um, good. So I had a question for you just on behalf of stakeholders and then also wanted to hear from the department on that too. Uh, I think rulemaking is fine the way it is. Thank you. Other questions for Senator Breen? Okay. Um, 
department. I don't know who wants to step up to the plate, if it's uh, Director McBrady or Liam. Liam, I guess I see your hand waving uh, at I, me. I'd like to take a swing at that first, actually, please, but sure. then I'll invite uh, Liam's input. Um, I definitely appreciate all that Senator Breen has done to, to put forward this amendment um, and uh, want to reiterate that the department is not opposed to contracting this out. Um, what, uh, to answer the question about um, the rulemaking at time frame, that is frankly aggressive, but uh, you know we can absolutely do as much as we can as quickly as we can. Without the input of AWAC, uh, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I would like to question whether uh, removing their uh, input here um, is, is, is necessary, um, given that they do have a lot of important perspectives and probably some creative thinking for us. Uh, and I would hate to lose the benefit of, of that partnership. Um, and really, I think the rubber is going to hit the road with the development of the RFP more so than any rules. Uh, that is where, you know, we need to take the time to craft something that uh, hopefully allows for a successful transition. Um, and, and whoever takes this on is successful um, in, in rising to the challenge of uh, appropriately managing this program. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, um, how often does AWAC meet? I don't know the answer to that. Director Hughes? Yeah, I'll come back to him in just a second. Um, the other thing, well, let's answer that first, go ahead. Uh, they usually are scheduled to meet every other month, but during the legislative season, season they've been meeting every month. Um, AWAC has just recently been reformed. For the past several years, there have been no appointments made, and we've been working very hard with the governor's office to get these appointments made. Uh, we are now scheduled to have our third meeting uh, in the past several months. That's going to be happening on February 16th at 1 p.m. And I believe Dr. Casey Cole, the chair of AWAC and also the president of the Maine Veterinary Medical Association is also available to answer any of your questions as one of the major stakeholders in this. Yeah, I think uh, our concern has been that AWAC hasn't been fully staffed or, you know, and therefore not meeting. And I wouldn't be surprised that that's some of the rationale for taking them out of the equation uh, because we didn't want it to go forward that way. Senator Breen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in reviewing and working on this, I looked up the statute for AWAC and um, there's nothing in the statute that mentions anything about them um, overseeing contracts or um, uh, you know, it's, it has an advisory role. And so there's nothing, um, there's nothing in this amendment that precludes them from having an advisory role. Um, and there's nothing in statute that gives them a specific role over contract issuing or RFPs or contract evaluation. Um, so I was trying to be um, consistent with statute. And then also um, having watched the um, AWAC meeting uh, recording from uh, last week, it was, uh, as Mr. Hughes stated in our last work session, that group is against this idea of sending out a contract and, um, and, and putting this program out to a contract. So um, I didn't think that, you know, based on that position that um, they're taking, that they were a sort of neutral um, third party or a neutral player in this. So um, I... That's that was one of the reasons I went back and looked at the statute and realized that you know what exactly their responsibility and authority is, and I think um, they can continue to offer their um, advice and counsel, which is um, what they were set up to do. Thank you, uh, Representative Underwood. You muted, sir. Representative Underwood, you're still muted. I believe it's time for you to move this on to uh, move this problem on and to try a solution as uh, Senator Bream has, has uh, put forth. So I motion to pass this as amended. 
ought to pass as amended. Okay. Is there a second? Representative O'Neill has seconded. So it's ought to pass as amended. Further discussion? Representative Pluker. Thank Karen. You, just before I do, Karen. Sorry. Um, there is a motion already on the floor. Um, ought to oh, pass right. as amended. It was already on there. It ought to pass <laughs> yeah, as Representative O'Neill and uh, it made okay. the motion and Representative Hall seconded it. Sorry, I. Yeah, no, nope, that's fine. I forgot that that was the position we're in. Thank you for that, Representative Underwood. That's where we are. So we're having discussion on the, the amendment. Thank you. Pluker. Yep, thank you. Representative Pluker. Uh, can I just get clear, are, are, is the amendment that is, that we're currently discussing this amendment that was presented today or was it a previous amendment? My understanding is the one that's presented today. Great, thank you. I had a question for Director McBrady. Could you just talk about the need for rulemaking versus going directly into a RFP process? Um, that's a that's a great question. I mean, uh, rules would would theoretically be put forward about um, process and some of the timing and 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 you know cornerstones of of contracting out. Um, but an RFP in and of itself is a bit of an art, and uh, we'll really have to dig into um the expectation setting and the requirements i mean this is ultimately the contract you know for for a third party um so i don't necessarily think rules are necessary but they can you know be of assistance in, in setting up process um but ultimately we want to make sure that we spend a lot of time putting together as robust and clear an rfp as possible is it could we speed the process up if we went straight to RFP and skip the rulemaking? I, I believe so. I, you know, that's one less thing to have to do. And it, Mr. Chair, it asked the question of Senator Breen, if that's yeah, all right. I'll, yeah, I will in just a second. So, so if we skip the rulemaking part, then July 1st this year is probably doable. Whereas with rulemaking, it may really tax everybody. Is that what I'm hearing you say? I would love to be able to make a July time frame. Um, that's, as I've said publicly before, I just want to make sure that this RFP is is high quality and we're putting in the right time and the thought for that. Um, I would love to be able to get this off the ground by July, but it is going to be a stretch with all the other things that we're doing at the department. I don't want to be seen as dragging our feet. I get it that people want change here, um, but I, I am leery of a July time frame as best okay. as we'll, we'll try and make it. Okay, thank you. We can talk about that in a minute. Representative Pluka, you wanted the Senator Breen to answer that question? Sure, if she had a comment on that, I'd, I'd appreciate hearing it. Um, let me make sure I understand your question, Representative Pluker. Would you mind just repeating it? Yeah, it, in, it, with the idea of trying to move the process along as quickly as possible, what would we lose if we if we remove the need for rulemaking from the bill and just went straight to the RFP process? Um, probably not much. I don't have a strong opinion about that. Okay, thank you. And then the other thing I just wanted to add about the RFP process is of course the Department of Administration and Financial Services has a whole procurement department and you know, they would be working with DACF, DAFs and DACF would be working together to put together the RFP and get it out there. So it's not just on DACF to, to do that process on its own. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had the same question about, um, about the need for rulemaking and I'm wondering if Karen could just help us out with um, just with understanding what that means. Because the way I'm picturing it is that maybe it would allow for um, some public review and accountability because it would have to be presented. People could um, could respond to it, but um, I don't want to unnecessarily slow down the process. So I just kind of want to get both sides of, of what it would mean to have rulemaking or not have rulemaking. Yeah, I mean, exactly what you said, Representative, it would, you know, obviously fall under the process under APA. And then it's kind of, um, 
you know, whether or not it's good that the, whatever the criteria or requirements are for a third party administrator can be found in, you know, department chaptered rules. Um, but, you know, either way they could enter into a contract, obviously. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, may I ask a follow-up of the sponsor? Sure. Thank you. Um, Senator Breen, do you think it would be um, something I'm thinking for an option is that we could um, pass the language as is and, and reflect on removing the rulemaking? Um, and if that's something that stakeholders think is a good idea on language review, we could make that change or we could make that change now. I just wanna think about process. So I guess what I'm, I just wanna make sure I understand your question. So you would suggest that we pass it um, without rulemaking right now and then revisit it at language review or vice versa? Um, I guess I'm saying either would work because I think on um, we would have a chance to review it mm -hmm. when we do language review anyhow. I just wanna make sure that the stakeholders have yeah. said either way that they feel like there's appropriate oversight without rulemaking if that's what we do. Um, I'm fine with that. Okay. Um, so could we then amend it to remove the rulemaking part? And then if folks feel like um, that's something they'd like, we could put it back in. It's, well, it's your, it's, it's your it's amended your, motion. <laughs> no, it's, it's your amendment. So. And uh, Representative Hall seconded the original motion. Um, oh. Is yep. I, I don't. I see his square, but I don't see him, so. Well, I, one of the things is, I think that since we're talking about the date before we amend that, being July 1st, and there's some concern, I think if we actually move, remove the rulemaking, that makes it a lot simpler, or I shouldn't say simpler, but may, makes it a, maybe an easier target because the rulemaking does have a certain process and a certain time frame added into it. So if we move the rulemaking, the July 1st um, date may be fine. If we keep rulemaking in there, we may want to consider moving it out a month or two, and I don't think people want to do that. So I guess, Representative O'Neill, I would certainly suggest we go along with what you just said and take the rulemaking out. So if your second is okay with that. I'm fine with that. So you're amending it to take that out, Representative O'Neill? The rulemaking. Yes, yes, please. And then something that's important if we take that out is making sure that we still have a date in place to. Yep, um, we haven't changed. Yep, we haven't changed the date. Okay. So, yep. Okay. So, uh, what will happen by July 1st? Enter into a contract? What does it say now? Rulemaking, promulgate rules. Okay. So I don't know that it's actually enters into a contract, but the contract will be ready to send out to, what would the process be, Director McBrady? What would you normally do? If you promulgated rules by July 1st, what would that mean to you? That the contract is now ready? Or the rules that govern the contract is ready and you would now put the contract out? As I'm understanding it, Senator, is that if rulemaking is struck, but there is now a date that we would have to be issuing the RFP by then. Yep. When it, and can't predict how a contract will go. And Senator Breen made a very helpful point about the procurement process that we as a department must um, follow. So we do the work of scoping out an RFP the folks over at the Department uh, of uh, Finan Financial Services then fly specs that, for lack of a better term, and really make sure that it's meeting all of the appropriate uh, parameters for a government contract for the state of Maine, and they have a time frame that that works against. So there's a bit of back and forth before it becomes a actual live document, and then there's a schedule for how many days it's issued, et cetera. So I would err on that being uh, the date by which we attempt to uh, issue the RFP. Okay. Is that suitable for everybody? Okay. Representative McRae, you have a question. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it, it seems to me that the gain by removing the, the rulemaking would be to get this program on the road, to have it, have it put in. Uh, this is probably a question for Director McBrady. Uh, what would we lose if, this, if, if the rulemaking piece is taken out? I don't believe we would lose much substantively, Representative McRae. That really makes that makes a lot of difference to me. Thank you very much. Other questions? All right. Seeing none, would you please call the roll? Whoops, Karen. Um, so I, I'm also curious, uh, given that we've made that adjustment to the July 1st piece, does the evaluation and report back to the legislature, um, does that make sense? Um, it's kind of a question for the department of January 1st, 2026. Um, that's a great question, Karen. I'm trying to do the math and the calendaring in my head. Um, so assuming that an RFP is successful and a third party takes on the program Q3, Q4, 2022, um, we're looking essentially at a three-year report out. Is that the way that it's written? I think yes. that's, I think that's a, I think that meets expectations. And I think that would be an appropriate time frame that allows um, for whomever takes this on to really see if they are, um, you know, we need to give them time to get up and running and prove this out. So that's fine by me. All right, Cheryl, would you call the roll please? Yes, LD 1828 ought to pass as amended. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill, yes. Senator Russell Black, absent. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman, yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. Yes. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, absent. Representative David McRae. Yes. Representative David McRae, yes. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. 10 yes, three absent. On LD 1828, uh, an act regarding a contract for the administration of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry's low cost spending and neutering program ought to pass 1003. It does pass. I will close the work session on LD 1828. And we will go on to opening the work session for LD 1744 and actually <laughs> increase funding for the animal welfare fund by increasing certain fees. Who and would you I like will, me to yep, bring uh, in? yep. We probably need the same players but still in here. Yep, Representative I see uh, Liam and Nancy are still here. I don't know that there's anybody else we need in here on that one. If we do, we'll come to them. Okay. So Karen, would you brief us please? Sure. Uh, so this needs to be taken off the table. And I have a motion to take this one off the table also. So move. It's been moved Second. by Representative Underwood and seconded by Representative McRae or something to that effect. Um, all in favor, just raise your hands, please. It's like everybody's in favor. Anybody opposed? Nope. Okay. It's off the table. All now, right. Karen. Uh, so uh, the original bill, there were kind of two parts to it. Sections one and two. Uh, <coughs> Current law provides that um, half uh, the fees collected from uh, registrations to distribute commercial feed in the state 
have. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> Representative Landry, do you have a? Oh, frozen. I guess he's he's just he's just frozen with his hand up. <laughs> Sorry about that. Go ahead, Karen. Talk to the hand. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, sections one and two, a, a current law provides that fees collected from registrations to, uh, to distribute commercial feed in the state, 50% go to the general fund and the other half goes to the animal welfare fund. And so what this bill proposed to do is uh, provide that 100% would go to the animal welfare fund. So while we did not receive a preliminary fiscal impact statement from- I, I have to interrupt you again, sorry. Yeah. I have to turn this over to Representative O'Neill because technically I'm the sponsor of this, so she should okay. be running this. So we, we didn't get the prelim preliminary fiscal impact statement, but we did hear from Director Hughes um, that the estimated fiscal impact, impact of this change would be approximately $550,000 of revenue lost to the general fund. So there was a lot of discussion at the last work session and in fact the department did provide you know they do uh, sort of realize um they did present some proposals that would mitigate that impact on the general fund and i there was discussion about i guess it was scenario number two in particular that would um you know that committee members talked about which would increase the uh, feed registration fees by $20. So currently it's um, $80. Those would increase to 100. And then also adjusting the ratio to general fund 40% and animal welfare 60%. So largely the general fund would, you know, there would be no net impact. And then it would generate approximately $280,000 in a uh, additional funds for the animal welfare fund. So there was a lot of discussion around that and um, word got out because we've gotten a lot of testimony in the last couple of days from the Pet Food Institute, um, American Feed Industry Association and others that um, they were concerned about, um, you know, they oppose increasing the uh, animal food registration fees. So. Um, and then the, the sort of what I see is the second part of the bill uh, in sections three, four, and five. Um, those parts of the bill um, amend the animal welfare laws to increase daily compensation to animal shelters holding animals uh, pending court decisions. And I won't go through those now, but um, presumably um, increasing revenue to the animal welfare fund would help cover uh, those increase uh, fees to shelters. So that's um, where we are at this point. I guess Representative O'Neill. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> it turned over. Um, thank you, Karen. Um, okay, so any questions from committee members for Karen? All right, seeing none. Um, just to remind everybody, I think Karen, is the motion on the floor what I had proposed and put forward? No. Um, so for this one, there it was just tabled and no one uh, made a motion or seconded it. It was just kind of a discussion. Okay. All right. Um, I see a hand up from Representative Hall. Thank you, Representative O'Neill. Uh, I would like to move the bill. Um, as presented by Senator Dill, and that's my motion. I'll second that, Representative O'Neill. Okay, and um, and what is your motion? And Karen, am, am I able to discuss anything? Oh, ab absolutely. Um, so I just wanted to clarify, it sounds like it's a straight ought to pass. Um, when you mean as presented by Senator Dill means going to the original bill as drafted. So the general fund only. Yes, that's correct. Ought to pass and just by all the money, all the money going to the department and none to the general fund. Okay, got it. Um, and, and does anyone, um, do you have comment on that, Randy, making that motion or just making the motion? Or Representative Hall, uh, sorry. Uh, no, uh, yeah, I was just going to make that motion. Um, 
I just feel that, you know, uh, my comment would be, and I think I've, I'm not going to speak for anyone else in our caucus, but I think that with the money that's available in the, uh, uh, right now that we hate to see any um, raising any taxes or raising any, any funds or fees to, uh, you know, for the industry. So I, I just think that it, I'd like to see it go this way. That's why I made the motion the way I did. Okay, understood. Um, I see a hand up from Representative Underwood. I do want to um, hear from the department on all of the options that were brought forward. Um, Representative Underwood. Hey, uh, yes, I'm concerned with the fees and, and basically I'm against, I'd like to remove the fees from the, from, from the bill if possible, make an amendment to do that and the fund itself and return the money to whoever whoever paid it in or whoever uh, paid it. And um, obviously you probably can't do that at this current time. I'm gonna vote again. I, I'm I plan on voting again. What is the status of the fees as far as, uh, as, far as what Rep Representative Hall has proposed? Are they still gonna remain as is or or is it a new fee structure? Thank you. Thank you, Representative Underwood. Um, so um, we do have a motion on the floor and um, I think I could explain it. I'll ask Karen to just repeat what the, what the fee structure is and what the bill does. And then so I wanna go to the department too. So um, it, the motion was a uh, straight ought to pass, although, um, moving forward, it will probably have a fiscal note only amendment. Um, but what the original bill proposes to do is to provide that 100% of the fees collected uh, from the registrations to, com uh, to distribute commercial feed in the state would go to the animal welfare fund. And then it also amends um, the compensation to animal shelters. Uh, it, um, for holding animals pending court decisions. So there was, there was that piece in sections three, four and five of the bill. So going back to Representative Underwood's question, it does not change current law, uh, which says the annual fee um, per product name for pet food is $80. And the total annual fee for a home-based manufacturer of pet food is uh, $80 and that's, for the year. And then it also provides that the annual fee is $80 per product name for all other commercial feed. So the bill does not change that. And then of course, um, there is the surcharge on registration of pet food, which is uh, $20 in addition to the registration fee, um, except a home-based manufacturer of pet food um, only pays the annual surcharge of uh, $20. So no changes have been made to that registration fee structure. Thank you, Karen. Um, I see a hand up from Representative Landry. I think um, what I'd like to do is um, hear Representative Landry's question, but just for the sake of um, making sure everybody's on the same page. I wanna bring up the department as well. So Representative Landry, what's your question? Uh, just an observation, uh, looking at the letter from the Pet Food Institute, uh, it seems they already think they're paying $100 per label. Maybe it was- They're just confused, <laughs> yeah. That was it. Well, yeah. may I address that? Yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry. Uh, is Karen. that okay? So yeah. I think I what they're it. referring to is there's the, so uh, in law, Title Seven, Section 714, Subsection 1, there is an annual fee of $80 per product name for pet food. And then if you go to Subsection 4, there is a $20 surcharge um, in addition to the registration fee. So 20 plus 80 is 100. So I think that's what they're referring to. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'd like to bring up um, Director McBrady for um, for questions, please. And, oh yeah, she's right there. Um, and Director McBrady, I'm just wondering if you can go over what it is that you need the funds for and something that um, 
I don't want to forget as a committee is that um, is that we just got out of the help fix me conversation. We're talking about how there's an urgent need and I'm concerned about, um, about this, frankly, dying on the appropriations table because we have a lot of important priorities in ACF, including the tier system and, um, and PFAS. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what the funds are needed for and, um, and other kinds of priorities that we're looking at fighting for um, from our committee. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, so just to ground everybody, first and foremost, the existing fee schedule has been in place for many decades and is fundamental to driving revenue for our current program. Um, our current program, and Director Hughes can speak to this uh, as well, spans many activities fundamental to animal welfare in this state. It is uh, licensure of animals. It is the inspection of uh, facilities and shelters. It is responding to animal welfare, animal cruelty cases. It is ensuring that those animals that are seized are appropriately housed and cared for by shelter partners and veterinarians. Um, and it also helps fund the Help Fix Me program, which we spent a lot of time digging into and are going to be transitioning to a third party, which will be paid by these funds. Um, but on the horizon, and as ex explained in our testimony to date, there are shortfalls in our program because it is driven entirely through dedicated funding. And we have a, a database that needs to be maintained and improved. We have staff that we can't actually hire right now, although you, are alloc you allocated the positions to us last session for humane agents that we can't staff because we're not, uh, we don't have enough dedicated revenue. We want to, as um, Karen uh, spoke to in our uh, bill before you, we would like to pay our shelter partners more for housing animals while they go through the legal system um, and are, are either returned to their owners or are uh, adopted out later, depending on the court case. Um, our animal seizure costs have increased over time and, in, and just our funding personnel, our existing personnel has increased. Um, so, so we're not balanced at present and there's a shortfall that is growing. And so we are coming to you to ask for creativity in filling that gap, which was why we presented a, a slate of options to you all about how to balance that and recognizing that there's a lot on the line here for agriculture from PFAS to, to the milk tier. Um, so there's, there's a lot of difficult weighing and conversations to have. We had put forward um, suggestions of increasing the fee as well as shifting the allocation, which right now is 50-50. We take 50% of the fees that come in and the other 50% goes to the general fund. So perhaps there's a way to alter that ratio so that we take more of what is coming in for fees and also increase the fees, which haven't been increased in over a decade to help fill that gap. Does that help? It does. Thank you, Director McBrady. Um, I see a question from Representative Landry. Um, sorry, back again. I just received a news feed from the Press Herald saying they just uh, confiscated 60 cats again from a woman in Wales. You gotta pay for it somehow. Thank you, Representative Landry. Um, uh, Oh, I see a hand up from Representative Underwood. I also want to hear from um, Director Hughes too. Basically my question, I'm Representative Underwood. Uh, basically my question was, is there a way to change the percentage that goes to appropriations uh, from 50-50 to say 80-20 in favor of the, of the department? Um, Representative, I would answer that um, Yes, that's we're discussing um, our different options that we could take. Um, right now, the structure is an eighty dollar fee on um, pet food manufacturers. Something I would like to consider, and I've had the um, and I've had Anna, um, Karen draft up is an option where we would take um, we'd look at the amount that the department has said they need, the amount that's a shortfall, and we would take half of it by increasing the pet food fee by $20 and then half of it 
from fighting for it on the appropriations table. And the reason I um, requested that amendment was because I'm really concerned that we're not going to be able to meet the needs that um, folks are describing if we take that risk, knowing all of the things that we really need to fight for um, in terms of PFAS tier system and, and lots of other stuff that we have discussed. I see a hand up from um, Senator Dell. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to Representative Underwood. Representative Underwood, actually what this bill does is it doesn't split it at all. It takes 100% of it that comes in from the pet food um, and feed charges and it all goes to the department. So, so that's what this bill does. You know, I mean, originally you figure that it came in as a feed surcharge. And at that time when the state was hurting for money, they decided that half of it would go to the general fund and only half of it would go to animal welfare. This bill just says, that's wrong. We've got some extra money right now. Let's put it all towards um, where it should really go in my estimation. Um, so that's that's what this does. But I hear what everybody's saying, especially Representative O'Neill. Things often have a tendency to die on the table. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair um, and Representative Schofield. Thank you, Representative O'Neill. I just wanted to echo what Senator Dill just said and, and just to go a little bit further. Originally, this money was set aside, was, was, was put in there in order to, to provide for this need. And in the process, 50% uh, of it was robbed to go to the general fund. And uh, like, he, like he just articulated, that's when the general fund was looking for every dime and penny they could scrounge. And that's not the case right now. So I believe that the original intent of this fee was to provide for the services that it's intended to provide and that we should uh, reinstate that to its initial and original uh, intent. And I think that if we proceed with this as the motion that we have on the floor now uh, articulates, I think we'll be in good faith. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Schoolfield. Um, something that you reminded me of was, um, was the ideological concern. And um, I wanted to say that I'm in line with that as well. If, if the money should be dedicated for that, um, ideologically, I agree with you. Um, I think what I'm really worried about is in practice based on our competing priorities. And I just wanted to share that there are a lot of bills that would try to do this kind of thing. And one is one that the committee has already voted out unanimously, which would try to keep general fund money. It, it would try to keep money that's going out from parks into the general fund in parks. So there are a lot of these ideas that are great, but competing. And um, so just wanted to float that. I'm, I'm thinking about in practice, will it, will it happen? And we're having these needs described. Hand up from Represent Representative Oh, sorry, if sorry. I could just follow up with you, Representative O'Neill. I okay. think right now there's a good chance that uh, we on the, the Republican side, to be frank, can work with our uh, appropriations people. And uh, I think that they will understand this. I, I, really, I really think that this is a winnable one. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. I appreciate the support for it. Um, Representative McCray. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my, uh, this, I don't know if this is a question for Director Brady or, or Dr. Hughes, maybe both. Uh, so let's suppose we, we go for it all and go to the appropriations and it dies. We don't get it. What's going to happen then if, if, if no increase in funding is happening? I mean, we've still got this need and it has to be done. This is, I mean, when this happens, it's these 60 cats that, that uh, Representative Landry mentioned, uh, something's got to be done with them. I mean, we're not going to turn our back on it. So, what would happen if if we just didn't get the money one way or another? I'll I'll take a stab at that and then turn it over to Director Hughes. But uh, we will do our job, Representative McCray. We will continue to provide these services um, and be in the field and be responsive. Um, but we will be in the red. 
unfortunately, because of that. Um, but Liam, I'm, I'm happy to let you address this as well. No, just to agree with uh, Director McGrady, we're still going to keep trying to do what we need to do to investigate the animal cruelty complaints and inspect the facilities. Unfortunately, some things might fall behind uh, in between the cracks. Uh, inspections might not be done uh, within a yearly basis. Uh, we might not be able to file uh, certain paperwork on time. So it's we're still going to do it. Uh, we're going to do it as best as we can, but it's incredibly difficult right now with the limited amount of staff, the limited amount of resources that are out there available to us, um, and the change of the basic culture with the amount of uh, veterinarian services available, the spaces at the animal shelters that just don't seem to be there anymore. So it's it's been a challenging already, but we're still going to keep trying every day, coming into work and doing what we need to do. Thank you, Director Hughes. I see a follow-up from Representative McRae. Thank you very much. Uh, well, with, with that having been said, I'm almost sorry that I asked the question, but uh, with that having been said, uh, I'm leaning more towards uh, the, the uh, combined approach where some of it comes out of general and, and some of it comes out of fee, fee structures, fee increases. Uh, but I guess really, truth be known, I, I'm, I'm leaning more less having less come out of general fund because we're more sure of it and have it come out of the fee structures. They're, they're still going to sell pet food and, and stuff in this state. They're not going to let $20 per label stop them. So I, I'm, I'm concerned about losing the thing, losing the funding. Uh, and uh, I think probably the most likely, the surest way of getting the money is to do it through the fee structure. I'm not crazy about that, but nobody is. So thank you. Thank you, Representative McRae. Um, any other comments or, or questions before we take the vote? All right, I'm not seeing any, um, and I just wanna state that, um, that I will be voting against the motion and that um, I wanna explain what my minority report would be so that folks making a choice could know. Um, it would be um, something that I have already drafted up um, or Karen has drafted up, I've requested it. And it would be um, an additional $20 on the fee so that we can ensure that we'll get half of what the department needs and, um, and then half of it would come from a percentage moving back from the general fund. So that was envisioned as a compromise um, between the, the two positions um, and intended to accommodate the concerns about the fee, but also make sure that there is a sure source of funding, um, knowing that appropriations is a gamble. So, All right. I see a hand up from Representative Booker. Is it, is it possible to share that amendment uh, screen share it, Karen? Maggie, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, Karen, could you please share that? Um, Karen, would you be able to describe it just because I didn't write it? So, <laughs> you're on mute right now. Okay. Um, so, um, this is the amendment that Representative O'Neill just described. So, in <clears throat> before section one of the bill, um, you would insert the, the changes to the registration fee for uh, commercial feed. So you see that um, it increases the annual fee from 80 to $100 per product name for pet food. Um, and then the total annual fee for a home-based manufacturer of pet food is um, $100 rather than the current 80. And then also the annual fee is increased from 80 to 20 per product name for all other commercial feed. Uh, so that's the first section. And then it amends the bill um, in so section one so that uh, instead of 50, 50, uh, 50 going to the general fund and 50 to the animal welfare fund, it would be 40% of the fees 
um, going to the general fund and 60% of the fees collected going to the uh, animal welfare fund. And then um, this additional section is just kind of keeping those percentages in line. So I think, um, let's stop my share here. Um, what I heard the department in, in the uh, spreadsheets that they provided to us. Um, so it looks like that would increase revenue to the animal welfare fund uh, by $279,360. And then there would be basically, as I said earlier, no net effect or uh, impact to the general fund with those percentages. Thank you, Karen, for um, describing the amendment. And just one thing I wanted to add was that um, a question had been, how would we compare to other regions? So I pulled up all of the fees um, across the states and I looked at our region and um, and it would make Maine match Massachusetts at $100. So it's not gonna make us um, the highest or an outlier. Representative Paul. Uh, I'd like to, you know, thank you for the work you did on that, but I'm kind of surprised that this is the first time that we really heard of it. Um, none of the rest of the committee knew anything about this amendment until we're just hearing of it right now. So I just, I guess it, I'm just kind of surprised that that you took it upon yourself and not to talk to the rest of us about, you know, what was going, what you had for an amendment. Oh, thanks and for I'm, presenting. And I'm, not in, and I'm not in favor of raising, raising the, uh, the uh, fees at all. So Representative Hall, um, I appreciate that concern. Actually, what happened was um, in our last work session, Representative Bernard had said she was interested in discussing this further. And, um, and I also on mic said that I would discuss it with her. So we took some time and um, not this past weekend, but I think the one before, um, we spoke on the phone for maybe an hour and a half, just discussing our different options and, um, this was something that I had laid out with her and we had agreed to, um, to pursue it further by just being with appropriations, et cetera. So, um, so this was, had been raised, but it was because I had been having this conversation as we agreed in committee with representative Bernard. She's just not here to discuss that. All right. Um, I see a hand up from, uh, Senator Dill. I just wanted to be clear from what you just said, and I'm not sure. So is this um, amendment a combination from you and Representative Bernard, or is this strictly from you uh, and she agrees with it, she doesn't agree with it, or you came to this conclusion together and you both agreed to this um, amendment? No, she had not updated me on where she landed after her conversations, but each of us had shared um, I had shared my preference for wanting it to be entirely the pet food fee. Um, and I had grounded that in economics. I, I didn't think that um, it would be a very big burden for the um, pet food manufacturers and that it made sense to help fund the program that way. And I was concerned about succeeding in appropriations. So that was me over here. And she was concerned about um, just using the fee for what it was for. So I had proposed this as a meet in the middle and Representative Bernard, I had not had the chance to hear where she was, but my sense is that she still wants to stay there. So I'm, you know, I'm here floating the meet in the middle, but I don't, I can't speak for her because she's not um, here to speak for herself. I see hands up, who was first? Representative Hall? Yes, uh, thank you. I did, uh, Representative Bernard is on the road right now. She's listening in on the phone and she did send me a message and said that she had not seen the amendment. So she was unaware of what, what you had proposed other than she had spoke with you, talked mm -hmm. to you in length, but uh, she hadn't seen the amendment or agreed to it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying what, what I'm presenting is a, is a meet right. in the middle. Um, and Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator. I'm sorry, Representative O'Neill. I know there is a motion before us and I just wanted to articulate why I agree with the motion a little more if I might. 
and that I don't think that we need to raise fees at this point in time. I think that the fee that is being assessed from these folks is adequate for the needs. And if we can just take the money and put it all towards this program and not divert the portion that is currently diverted to the general fund will be fine. And I'm willing, and I think we are in a good position. I think some people think that's a risk to do that at this time with appropriations, but I don't think that risk is, is there. I think that the appropriations can be convinced that uh, this is a good move, especially with the, uh, with the situation we find ourselves in today. So this money would then 100% of it would go towards the program, not 50%. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Schofield. All right, do I see any more comments? Uh, I see a hand up from Representative Osher. So this is, so can you have, can Cheryl or someone read or tell me what the emotion was? Because if this is, this is the, uh, minority report, what is the majority, what is, or what is the motion? Who knows it's majority, minority until we vote, but what is the motion and what um, that you're amending? Um, I can answer that. I, sorry, I was looking at Karen. Um, so we have two options. Um, I can't say whether it's majority or minority, right? Because we don't know that until we take our vote. Um, the option that has been floated and is on the floor is what Senator Dill originally presented, which is to um, to shift all of the fees that are split into the general fund and bring them back. And then um, I will be voting no on the motion. And, and what my no motion will mean is this compromise that does half and half. And at the very least, we'll guarantee the department um, some source of revenue. Is everybody good to take a vote? Knowing what's on the floor? All right. Seeing no questions, um, could we please call the roll? Yes. LD 1744 ought to pass. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill, yes. Senator Russell Black. Absent. Senator Chloe Maxman. No. Senator Chloe Maxman. No. Representative Ma Maggie O'Neill. No. Senator Maggie o uh, Representative Maggie O'Neill. No. Rep yeah. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Lori Osher. No. Representative Lori Osher, no. Representative Joseph Underwood. Um, sir, you are on mute. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood, yes. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. No. Representative Bill Pluker, no. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, af um, absent. Representative David McCray. No. Representative David, oh my gosh. Representative David McCray. No. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. Five yes. Five ought to pass as amended. And three absent. Uh, so that's what the minority report is. Um, ought to pass as amended as you just presented, Representative? Yes, please. Okay. Yes, please. So at this point, we do not know which is the majority or which is the minority report until votes come in. All right, sounds good. We'll stay tuned. And um, Karen, is there anything else? Or, so that closes the work session on um, this bill, at least 1744. And Karen, do we have any other material to go over today? Not today. Um, as I usually like to remind everyone, um, what's coming up on Tuesday, we're only meeting once next week. Um, so we're going to get a briefing from the Wild Blueberry Commission of Maine at 11. Uh, that will go about an hour. And then at 12 noon, we're getting a report back about agricultural land and siting solar arrays. 
Um, and just so you are all aware, the energy and utility committee members uh, have been invited as uh, panelists to participate on that briefing since the report goes to them as well and environment and natural resources, but um, it, it works out for EUT to join us. And then we have a work session on uh, four bills. So it might be a lengthy, lengthy session. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, Representative McCray, hand up. Yes, <clears throat> Karen, I didn't catch, was that, that the Tuesday meeting? Yes. And you're not meeting on Thursday because you have session. Okay, very, okay, very good. Thank you. All right, anything else? I see a motion to adjourn. All right, oh, see one for, oh. Move, we adjourn. I saw a represent, sorry, I think Representative Blucher had a question. We can go back to that. Thinking, the solar sighting is not today, right? That's down the, down the line. Exactly. Yeah, that's on Tuesday. Great, thank you. All right. I'm ready to All right, I saw a motion from Representative Schofield, second. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good weekend. See you. Take care. Take care. Stay, stay safe in the storm. No corner caucus today. Um, what is today? Thursday. Thursday. Oh, we can do that. Yeah, let's do that. Absolutely. Yeah, let's go on the link. I'll forward that. All right, thanks.